very much and a very good evening, everybody. Welcome to my talk, Britain's First Space Rocket. Now, normally when I'm giving a talk in person, I say to people, um, anybody at the back, please stick your hands up if you can't hear me. So clearly I'm not able to do that this evening. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed. The technology is all working. And those of you at the back can hear me. Right, so let's move on. So indeed, this talk is about Skylark, which was the very first British rocket to reach space. And it had a service life of nearly half a century. It lasted for 48 years. Hundreds of fired and lots of experiments were taken up into space. And as, uh, as Tracy sort of touched on there, uh, people often ask me, did I actually work on the Skylark rocket program? The answer, unfortunately, is not. I was an electronics engineer during my working career. And um, I started reading about the Skylark, and I thought this sounds like the most interesting thing, which I've not heard about before. So I started on some research carried out for my book of the same name. And as Tracy alluded, I thought it would take about six months because there wouldn't be too much material. And it did end up um, taking six years to put all this lot together. And much of the material was uh, previously unpublished, which is why I haven't seen it before. And some of that will be shown this evening. I'll start off with three clarifications just to set the scene. And this first one really is when I give local talks. Now, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but I'm talking to you today from Hampshire, from uh, Fording Bridge there on the bottom left hand side of this map. Um, and this is really to explain things to people who do live locally and may get confused. But the Skylark sounding rocket is what I call the Hampshire rocket, it is originally designed and built in Farnborough. In the, in the top right hand corner of the county there and not to be confused with these rockets which were designed and built in East Cowes on the Isle of Wight and they were about five times larger and they were for military purposes but the Skylark rocket which came just a little bit before then was purely for civilian purposes. Now the second clarification is that Skylark was a sounding rocket and didn't actually launch satellites and what were these? Well, these were the precursors to Earth satellite launches. Uh, the graphic there shows uh, the trajectory of a typical satellite launch with the, with the trajectory that the satellite goes into at the top. And that blue line shows, shows the nominal border of space at 100 kilometers altitude. And if you look carefully on the left hand side, you should see in red the trajectory of a typical trajectory of a Skylark sounding rocket. Now that may not look very impressive, but it goes up to 250 or 300 kilometers. And it was an order of, better, or order of magnitude better than it could be accomplished before. And British scientists could send their instruments up some eight or 10 times further than they could, could have done originally with the meteorological balloons, which went up to 25 or 30 kilometers. And the third and last clarification is that Skylark is no longer made. As I said before, it was in service for some 48 years. And this graphic shows the annual numbers of Skylark launches per year over its uh, lifetime. So starting on the left, there was four in 1957. It fairly quickly rose to a peak of 35 in 1970. And then there's this long tail through the years until 2005. And I'll explain some of the reasons for that as I go along. Uh, a little bit of family history. How did the Skylark rocket originate? Well, after the end of uh, World War II, the UK embarked on a program of defensive missile research. And uh, a year or two later, they started a program of offensive missile research. And this was in support of the medium range ballistic missile, which they were intending to make, which was ended up being called Blue Streak. Now, at the same time, civilian scientists were becoming increasingly interested in the upper atmosphere. And uh, what happened was that the civilian uh, party and the military parties got together uh, via the Royal Aircraft Establishment. And that diagram on the right hand side shows the design uh, as it was becoming finalized. And that looks quite like the final Skylark design. So who were the people tasked with actually producing this? Well, it was the Royal Aircraft Establishment and their, their specification, 
They initially got a little bit of funding. A hundred thousand pounds doesn't sound very much these days, but it's equivalent to about 10 million pounds. Original specification, 68 kilograms, up to 169 kilometers. And I shall read this bit out because it's quite important. The ideal upper atmosphere rocket should be easy to manufacture, prepare and fire, and the total cost should be kept as low as possible. And this had various implications in its performance, and I'll talk about those in a moment. And these, this earnest looking bunch of people were those tasked with the designing Britain's first space rocket. The gentleman on the left is Frank Hazel. He, he died many years ago, but his son was extremely helpful in providing information when I was preparing my book and doing research. And the other gentleman went on to have distinguished careers within the aerospace industry. And the gentleman third from the left, Eric Dawling, is quite interesting. I published my book in December 2014. And in the spring of 2015, I received an email from Eric Dawling saying he'd bought a copy of my book and found it very interesting. And thank you very much. And I thought that was very nice. And of course, this was 2015. This picture was taken in 1955. And that is, if my maths is right, is some uh, 60 odd years later. So I thought, goodness me, how old is he now? So in 2015, if he's 30 there, he must have been at least 90 when he uh, emailed me. So that was a rather nice sort of uh, message from the past, as it were. Uh, and this is the diagram of the first Scala rocket. It was in three main parts, the payload head, the Raven motor, and a large uh, fin assembly at the back. And the whole thing was about eight meters long. Later versions are about three times that length, but this is where they started. They also needed a launch tower. And why was that? And this is one of the implications of trying to think, keep the thing as cheap as possible. It had no active guidance system and took off relatively slowly. One of the reasons for the latter is the fact that it had um, glass-based thermionic valves in there, no solid state electronics in these early days. And we ended up designing and building this rather splendid uh, launch tower. And this was exactly the equivalent for November the 5th milk bottle. And for those of my generation who used milk bottles to launch their rockets on November the 5th, before they had these little plastic tubes, you put your rocket in there and pointed it in the direction you wanted to go and hoped it would land in the right place. And this tower was designed to do exactly that. It had a certain ability to tilt, it had a certain ability to rotate, uh, and this is what they used. Now, there was no, no room to launch this thing in the UK. It's far too populated. And the choice fell on this place called Woomera in South Australia, where there was a large Anglo-Australian land-based experimental weapons range, which had been there for about 10 years. And this map shows where it is, if I can use my pointer and if you can see that. Um, the HQ for this uh, Woomera range was at the Salisbury suburb of Adelaide. And during the height of the Cold War, there were a lot of people there, about 10,000. Then the Woomera village itself, the sort of outstation, was some 350 miles northwest of, uh, of Adelaide itself. And then the actual um, place where the rockets were launched, the rain shed, was another 35 miles odd to the northwest of that. And this rather fine aerial photograph shows the range E. This was a big range, it had a big uh, range altogether. It had several ranges, individual ranges. And this one I think is the launch apron LA2. And if you can see my pointer there, it's pointing to the original 80 foot Skylark launch tower. These are the, this thing was most, mostly used for military purposes. And these are various missiles here being tested for the British Army, Navy and Air Force. And if you can see that, that's the concrete bunker used by the launch officer. And on the left hand side here is this thing called EC2, Equipment Centre 2, where all the scientists and engineers used to uh, go for safety when a rocket launch was about to take place. And there's always various ancillary buildings and test shops there in the background. Now, if you were driving up that road in the direction of the blue arrow, what would you see? And the answer is that, because 59 years after that, 
in 2016. I was lucky to be able to have a proper conducted tour of all the parts of Woomera that you're not allowed to go to normally. And I went up onto the concrete launch apron from where all the skylights in Australia were launched from. Uh, unfortunately, the launch tower itself is long gone. But uh, if you can see that circular mark there on the concrete, that's the mark made by the exhaust. And one of the footings that is just there, uh, as I say, the, the, um, the tower itself was cut up with scrap quite a few years ago. But there's still various bits and pieces of hardware on site. And that's yours truly, standing on the very point where the skylights were launched from. And behind me is the area into which they were launched. Now the terrain there is very much like a British moorland, except instead of heather, you've got salt bush, and instead of ponies, you've got uh, kangaroos and wallabies. And if I look a bit bedraggled there, it's because the temperature was 40 degrees in the shade, and there wasn't any shade. So I hopped back into our air-conditioned vehicle fairly soon after that photograph was taken. And how people actually worked in those conditions, I do not know. And so the area behind me wasn't completely deserted. This map shows an area about the size of England. And if you can imagine that that's London at that dot on the bottom right hand side. I'll get this thing to go down there. And this radius on the top left is about the border of Scotland. This whole thing is the area of England, as I say, not completely deserted. It's full of, um, well, I say full, it's not full compared to the UK, but there's all these sheep stations and cattle stations, the homesteads dotted around. And the reason they look a bit like frog spawn is there's a little circle around each one, which is a safety area into which you are not supposed to launch your rocket or not supposed to aim your rocket. Now, it was said that if you aim for one of these things because of inaccuracies and all the rest of it, that was the most likely chance of missing it. And that would have been tempting fate. So I don't think they ever did that. And as you can see from this diagram, there's an aimed impact point there in that sort of nice empty space. Again, what would you see if you're looking in the direction of the blue arrow? And you will see that this is the Twins homestead, a typical homestead of the area, some 100 miles downrange. And this is showing this thing a shelter. Now, this may look remarkably like a World War II air raid shelter from the UK, because that's exactly what it was. The Skylight was the first of the long range rockets to be launched from Woomera. Quite a lot of different ones followed on afterwards. And so every homestead had one of these air raid shelters built next to it and they ran the very first telephone lines they ever had to all of the homesteads and the idea was that they had 48 and 24 hour and one hour and 10 minute warnings and everybody was supposed to go and hide in one of these air shelters air raid shelters i'm now going to attempt to show a video and hopefully you'll be able to hear the sound the sound is a little bit faint my apologies for that i have tried to increase it but without success so let's give it a go. But it's, it's not very long. And this is the sort of thing that happened. Uh, this little cartoon by Len Bidell shows him standing on top. So as I said, my apologies, the sound on that one's a little bit faint, but the other audio and video clips I've uh, got to show, they should be okay. So moving on to the actual rocket itself, kind of like Zero One, SL01 was launched in February 1957. And this, of course, was before the first satellites were launched. Sputnik 1 was launched in October 57. This was purely a test flight, deliberately low, only went up to 12 kilometers. Recovery 29 miles down range. And this was regarded as mo most successful. And we have to bear in mind, of course, no computer simulation in those days, no electronic calculators. And so their calculations and their design all have to be done with pen and pencil. 
I'll say next, hopefully if it all works and you can hear the sound a little bit better, there's an extract and this shows the launch of SL01. This is the Warmer Rocket Testing Range in South Australia. My name is Tom Cook and I'm in charge of the preparation and firing of a Skylab upper atmosphere sounding vehicle. This vehicle has been designed by the Royal Air Traffic Establishment in Farnborough and is to be used for experiments at altitude from 70 to 90 miles during the IGY. These experiments will be used to determine the temperature and pressure of various heights and to study such other phenomena as day and night air day. All posts from Sub 1, information on the Skylark sound. The round of missiles from the Skylark launcher on apron number 2. Line of fire, 313 degrees. Chewy, seven sites to be. Stoppler uh, ready. Stoppler ready. Calimetry ready. Calimetry ready. Contact ready. Contact ready. Contact ready. Engine ready. Kinney's ready. Kinney ready. Timing section ready. Timing section ready. Smoke rockets will be fired at minus two minutes and minus ten seconds to enable the wind structure to a thousand feet to be obtained. <laughs> Good, right. I hope you can hear the sound. Get my fingers crossed on that one. And those are the days when tape recorders are real tape recorders, not little bits of electronics you could drop between the floorboards. And there we are. All right, moving on a little bit. Skylark 04, the fourth one launched in November 1957. This was the first British rocket to actually reach space. And there's a sort of time, time lapse type photograph taken during a moonless night. It's quite interesting to actually study the trajectory of this thing, which I shall show you now. Um, after the first 10 seconds, it would have broken the sound barrier. 20 seconds, 1500 miles an hour and into the stratosphere. And at 40 seconds, they had what we call all burnt at some 19 miles or 30 kilometers of altitude. And I hadn't realized this before I started researching the rocket. I just vaguely assumed that they'd been powered all the way up into space. But no, only the first sort of 10 or 15% of the trajectory is, is powered, and the rest of it is a purely uh, ballistic trajectory in this parabola. It goes up and comes down again. So this first one reached space just after two minutes, sorry, just under two minutes. And that's a nominal border of space again at 100 kilometers. It was up there for about two and a half minutes, although later versions went up a bit higher and we let, could be up there longer. And it came down and recovered some 100 miles down range. And the results were considered very satisfactory. Two out of the three university experiments returned good results. And of course, they launched lots of these. And uh, over the next year or two, they managed to sort all their experiments out and get them all working. So this is my before picture, 
under the nose cone, the university experiments were all there in the payload. And this is my after picture, what I've called instant archaeology, what happens when a man-made object returns from space without a parachute, because at this stage we have no soft, uh, soft recovery mechanism. And once I've done a few proving flights, the actual science program began. And as it shows there, between 1958 and 1960, there were quite a few of them launched. And during this time, 47 scientific experiments have flown, mostly measuring the upper atmosphere in the first instance, but moving into having space experiments. And as you can see, they put several, perhaps up to five or six experiments on each rocket, uh, as long as they were all reasonably compatible. As I say, the space experiments followed fairly quickly. The first one designed by UCL, University College London. And that model of their telescope is still available to see in the London Science Museum outstation. There's a schematic, a little bit of detail. Use these new things called photomultipliers and uh, the results again were regarded as being very satisfactory all sent back again by telemetry still no parachute at this stage and this rather begs the question why use skylark to look beyond the atmosphere why do you need one in the first place and this graphic here tries to show the point of it all this blue line shows a nominal border of space again and here we have the, the electromagnetic spectrum, the longer wavelengths on the right and the shorter on the left. And as we can see, there's only two windows, so-called windows, which reach the ground. And that one there in the middle is shows the optical window, which uh, astronomers use to look at with their telescopes. And then the more recently, so sort of post-war discovered radio window. And if you were a scientist, and in those days, they didn't know about this, if you're surmising that there were ultraviolet and x-ray radiations to look at which are, would be of interest or even some of the infrared radiations which could be of interest you had no way of finding out if you were ground-based and so you had to send your experiments your instruments into space now once the rocket was sort of proved and it uh, developed that fully they're able to expend some of their resources on enhancements and the first one of these was indeed a payload recovery system so here's the problem at the end of the flight this thing would impact the ground at high speed if it landed on stony ground it had the result you can see there if it landed on muddy ground or into one of these salt ponds it would just disappear with the glute never to be seen again so the cue was to try and soft land the payload and the solution they adopted was based on the aircraft establishment Martin Baker pilot, pilot ejection seat system. The payload head will be separated, it would eject a drogue parachute, this will pull out the main parachute, and that in theory the whole thing would come down gently to the ground. The first two tests fails, but it was third time lucky. And these uh, they're basically pole ride. Polaroid photographs which have been scanned. They're the very first, they show the very first British object to be soft landed after re entry from space. Um, again, these, pub these pictures had never been published before. I managed to get a, a colleague I was working with to uh, bring, bring them out of an Australian archive, and they're all scanned and sent over to me in the UK when I do my research. And I, I think they're extremely interesting. So we'll go back to this, this last comment again in a minute. And what we have to, this was done in 1961. And what we have to realize in these very early days, there was no digital electronics or capability whatsoever. And if you wanted to recover pictures from space, it wasn't practical to do so. And what the sounding rockets were able to do was allow scientists to recover the film. Yes, it was obviously useful to recover your camera and use that again. But sounding rockets enable you in a quite a cheap manner to recover your photographic film and this was extremely valuable and this was a property which Skylark shared with the very first manned missions because the first uh, astronauts in space used cameras and 
pointed them out of the windows of their capsule, and obviously they will return to Earth and they can bring their cannons back with them. And the second enhancement was this thing called the attitude control system. Uh, once in space, the fins are no use to you. The, the payload will just spin around at random. And so they developed the attitude control system. There's a hardware on the left. There's a schematic on the right. And the important thing about this, it's got three axis control. It controls the yaw and the pitch, and most importantly, the roll. Uh, and this allowed some pioneering astronomy to be carried out. And this is one of the very early cameras that was used. You can't focus X-rays with glass in a normal manner, of course. You can use a pinhole camera. This may not look like a camera, but it was indeed one. And this was the resulting soft X-ray image of the sun. Now, I know this doesn't look very much compared with the magnificent pictures we get back of the sun these days. But this was work in progress. This was pioneering first time, first time work. And these, this photo was one of an example of the, the ones that were the first non-smeared X-ray images ever obtained of the sun. And the reason I say this is because U.S. sounding rocket, sounding rockets at the time, they didn't have a roll control on their payloads and all their images were spun around in effect and came out blurred. So this was state of the art, 1960, or well, this one was 1964 odd. Meanwhile, the first Skylark launch outside Australia took place, and this was from Sardinia, an island in the Mediterranean, and it was sponsored by this new organisation the European Space Research Organization, and this was the forerunner of ESA. And this was Europe's very first ever cooperative space launch. Now these days we accept the fact that you need a large economy to be able to afford uh, expensive space missions which go out to the outer planets and asteroids and comets and so forth. You need a continental size economy, the USA, China, Russia and so forth. But in Europe, individual countries have to band together. And this was the very first time this had ever happened, and Skylight was the instrument they used. Meanwhile, back in Australia, Skylights were going into their program with ever increasing pace. And these were the people that the uh, people working on Skylight could call on. And I was in email contact with a couple of these people. And in fact, I met Paul, Arkin, Paul Malcolm when I went out there in 2016. Now we move on to some of the astronomy. Um, so we now looking at solar, the UV observations of the sun, solar UV observations. And what they realized was that the sun is a great big ball of plasma or whatever. And it's a very useful uh, fusion experiment going on in the sky, which you can study. And so the Cullen Research Laboratory devised this particular experiment. And I was quite impressed by this fact. I mean, it's 100 mile to the 100 mile journey through space. This stabilized the image of the sun to three seconds of arc, which is better than one thousandth of a degree. And this enabled them to obtain this particular UV spectrum. And some of the emission lines were new to science. So again, we have a relatively cheap sounding rocket carrying out state-of-the-art experiments. But all such missions were successful. They had one night when they tried to take do uh, seven launches. Didn't get off to a good start. And this is what's happened. What's happened here is the booster rocket has fired, but the main sustainer motor didn't ignite for whatever reason. And the thing came down with a bit of a bang. It's not high explosive, it doesn't go off with a huge bang, but it goes off with enough of a bang to uh, destroy the rocket and ruin all the experiments. And this poor chap <laughs> was wondering where his rocket's gone. I'm afraid it's all disappeared in dust. So moving on to UV astronomy, we're looking at the stars. One of these experiments came from UCL. And this chap, John Raymond, worked for MSSL, the Mullard Space Science Laboratory, which is still going strong. 
and it used these newly invented photomultipliers and the latest uh, bit of um, solid state electronics there. And that looks a bit like a Paxlin board to me. Uh, and then they, as I said, they did manage to do some solar X-ray astronomy. I moved on from the pinhole cameras and using different techniques. And they were able to produce sort of scanned X-ray maps of the sun like this one there. And these were an improvement on the original earlier ones. Now we move on to X-ray observations um, coming from the stars or the cosmos in general. And this was a completely new branch of astronomy. And back in 1962, a US rocket made the unexpected discovery of an astonishingly powerful X-ray source. Now, as I've just explained, astronomers knew perfectly well that X-rays were emitted from the sun and they could take images of in X-ray light. But they were also fully aware that if other stars emitted X-rays at the same power as our sun did, there was no hope whatsoever of um, being able to detect those with the instruments of the time. So when X-rays from beyond the sun were discovered, um, there was no known physical phenomena which could account for these. And this raised a great deal of interest amongst astronomers and physicists. These days we know about uh, black holes and neutron stars and colliding galaxies and all the rest of it. But in those days, I had no idea whatsoever. So the sky was enthusiastically explored using various methods. In 1967, several Skylark missions were launched for this purpose. Uh, 1967 was the first such Australian mission. And this was the hardware, still fairly basic in these days. This was the aluminium egg box array mounted for a counter. And these are the days when, again, state-of-the-art observations could be made and scientists and astronomers could name the individual X-ray sources as they were discovered. However, since those pioneering days, the number of X-ray sources discovered has expanded dramatically. And this table shows just that happening. Starts off 1, 10, 60. And as they launched uh, X-ray detecting satellites, this increased very fast until, as you can see there, by 2013, there were over a million. And I've no doubt there's a lot more now. And scientists, I think, and astronomers, they realised that the sky was full of X-ray sources and they were just as common as perhaps as optical sources. Meanwhile, the uh, instrumentation on the Skylark was uh, improved. They designed a, a star sensor and they needed to test this by pointing at real stars. And they built this rather fine miniature observatory at Ball Hill down in Farnborough. And they used this to test the, in, the new instruments in daylight. And this was the star sensor which was going to be mounted in the Skylark rocket. This example uh, can still be seen in the London Science Museum. Now, after the project was finished, after the development was over, the observatory was closed down for 24 years until it was restored in about 1997. And I rather like this. Happily, someone had thoughtfully left an electric bar fire on when the building was closed. This clearly helped keep the damp away. And I rather like the idea of this thing blowing away for some 24 years. Unfortunately, the maker of the fire hasn't been recorded for posterity. As I said at the beginning, in 1970, the record number of 35 skylights were launched worldwide. And this was the size of the room operation, not just for the uh, skylight, but for all the different trials taking place at range G. On the left hand side there, we have the Black Arrow rocket. On the far right hand side, we have a skylight rocket. In between are smaller various military rockets. And just to the left of Skylark is a Black Arrow rocket, which, sorry, a Black Knight rocket, which is slightly smaller than the Black Arrow. Uh, 
Now, as scientific satellites started to come into use, they had to find a new role for Skylark. And it, uh, they made a valiant attempts to become the world's first Earth resources rocket. And so they're pointing the cameras upwards, they pointed them downwards. And the idea is you could scan the surface of the Earth in that particular manner. And what they did, they took a World War II aerial reconnaissance camera and shoehorned it into a Skylark instrumentation bay. And they took some of the very first photographs ever taken from space. And they're quite astonished at what good results they could obtain. And this is a view to the northeast of Woomera, taken from about 250 kilometers up. And what looks like a large white cloud at the top there is in fact Lake Eyre. And this is where Donald Campbell in 1963 broke the world land speed record in one of his uh, bluebird cars. In the center there, we do have clouds. You can just see the uh, shadows underneath. And I reckon this was the highest resolution photograph ever taken in the civilian sphere with about 100 meter resolution. And the reason I say this and this is only in the civilian uh, sphere. I don't know what was happening as far as spy satellites were concerned. But in the civilian sphere, at this time, Germany astronauts were taking pictures out of the windows of their capsules using Hasselblad cameras, and their negatives were about two and a quarter inches square. And the negatives that came back on this old RAF reconnaissance instrument, the camera that was fitted, they were four inch square negatives, and clearly they were a lot larger had better resolution. They went on to do earth resources measurements of Argentina. And this is a view they took from, again, from about 240 kilometers up. And this is in the Southern Hemisphere summer. And if I can put my point on here, these dots represent sort of snowy peaks on the Andes. Beyond there is uh, Chile and beyond there is cloud coming in from the Pacific. So you could get some quite good views from Skylark. Now you might think that these uh, photographs will be carefully preserved in archives, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. And during my research for my book, some 36 years later, I was shown a mysterious cardboard box under a bench in the University of Reading, and that's it there. And the lady technician who had saved this box didn't know what the film showed. So we sort of unwound these things and stuck them on her scanner. And I was able to identify the images. And because they're a reversal film, these are the actual films that were flown in space. Now, a few years later, the lady was made redundant and there was a danger all this lot be thrown in the skip. All a bit sad. And here we can see another photograph of the film cans. <coughs> me. And as you can see, they're marked as originals. <clears throat> and fortunately, I was able to persuade the University of Reading to take custody of these things, and they're now in a special collection, and people can go and look at them in their archives. In going back at Farnborough, this rather nice uh, picture, the only one to be able to obtain of the Skylark at the RE. There's a couple of young ladies at the open day wearing the uh, skirts of the time. And that's building Q65 in the background where Skylark was originally designed and manufactured. Uh, moving on to describe a few more of their astronomy experiments. Uh, SL1206. They did have quite a few problems out there. It wasn't a very nice environment in many ways. And cockatoos used to come along and devour all the plastic they used on the air conditioning system. The air conditioning was not for the people, it was for the instrumentation. And I rather like this bit, so I should read it out. Firing rockets managed to account for a few of them, the cockatoos. Only the legs of the bird tenants remained. The claws still firmly holding on or the bodies have gone with wind. And here we have another one, SL1012. Now even a sounding rocket launch, it may not be as big as an orbital launch, but it still generates a huge amount of paperwork. 
and uh, John Zarnecki, who worked at the Open University back in 2007, was kind enough to send me uh, scans or copies of one of these trials instructions. And they were big documents which did, um, carefully wrote down everything that went on. You can see, if you can see the top right, this is page ACB. And this bit, which has been highlighted in blue, John's going to talk about. And if you ever get the chance to listen to his 2007 OU lecture, and as far as I know, it's still available online. Anyway, it's well, well worth listening to. It goes on for an hour or so, and this is just a short audio extract. In a minute, I'm going to play to you my recording of the, the last uh, 25 seconds or so of the countdown. I, it's not a very good quality because this was an illicit recording. Wilmer was a high security uh, Ministry of Defence site, so I had to smuggle the tape recorder in. Now, this was, remember, this was my first ever launch. Let, let's hear it. We were in a bunker about 100 metres away, just under the ground, and at about minus 15 seconds, I had to make a decision as to whether we would launch or not. I just said, gas okay, Jackie, so that was the okay. I was terrified, everything crossed. That's 10 seconds to go, I think. Fingers crossed, toes crossed, five. It was absolutely fabulous. I mean, that sound, that blast wave went through your body. The rocket is already three miles up. It went up with enormous acceleration. It got above the atmosphere. The X-ray telescope pointed at the correct source on the sky to an accuracy of about a hundredth of a degree. It was a very, very challenging task, and it pretty well worked. Now this, I think, shows one of the other uses for the Skylark rockets. People could get very involved. People did their PhD uh, research based on instruments put in Skylark rockets, and it was a very good training ground for future future careers. And John Zarnecki, as people may know, went on to become uh, one of the leaders of uh, instruments which had landed on on the moons of various outer planets and so on. Moving on to SL-1304, another interesting mission. Um, Skylights were launched from Spain as well as of Australia and Spain and Europe. And there's a launch site, a sort of temporary launch site, uh, a few miles west of Gibraltar. And one of the advantages of launching from Spain is you didn't have to fly or go by ship all the way out to Australia. You could hop in your Land Rover and actually drive there as these PhD students did. It wasn't a permanent launch site. You had to take all your kit with you, uh, obviously in shipping containers and a bit of scaffolding and so on there. And it was a very different environment to Woomera. If you manage a bit of a, a bit of a break at lunchtime, you can go swimming or climbing up the cliffs. There's some sandstone cliffs there, fairly soft. And if you look carefully on the right hand side, you can just about see a little bit of graffiti has been carved into the sandstone cliff. And if you zoom in on it, you can see Lester there, SL1304. So um, clearly these PhD students had a little bit of time on their hands. And I think this must be a unique um, homage, if you like, to uh, the Skylight sounding rocket. Possibly incorrect handling procedure. And these are an interesting bunch of people. Uh, starting from the right hand side, that's Barry Giles. I met him in Hobart. He went to live in Hobart uh, in Tasmania, South Australia. And next to him is Roy, whom I don't know about. Next to him is Roger Cooper, who set up a, a company in the UK and I met a year or two ago and still exchanged emails with. And this gentleman on the left hand side is particularly interesting. That's Jeff Hoffman. And the cowboy hat may give a clue that he was American. After he had finished doing his PhD at Leicester University, he went back to the States, he joined NASA, he became an astronaut, um, he went up in the shuttle four times altogether, and he was the gentleman who did the very first ever attempted repair of the Hubble Space Telescope when they were trying to collect the color, uh, pardon me, trying to uh, correct the faulty optics. And here we have a picture of him doing just that. So again, 
people cut their teeth on the skylight sodium rocket and that could lead to interesting careers in the future. SL1306, a black hole candidate. People were starting to learn about these things. And the techniques they used here were to put detectors under the um, nose cap, if you like, of the, sun, of, of the skylight sun rocket. And once in space, these things had to open up. And they were slightly homemade. That's probably a little unkind. But you could build payloads for a sounding rocket. They only had to be up there in space for 10 minutes. So they didn't have to work 10 years and were not easier and cheaper to make than satellites uh, instrumentation. So you could use you know, motorcycle parts or whatever your uh, local uh, mechanical technician could put together for you. Uh, that's the launch of SL1306. And this is only the second audio recording I know of a launch. So let's see if we can play that. Very poor quality. So, looking at six, let's be going. Now, I have given a talk at the BISHQ in London, and I've had several people in the audience who are actually in the uh, EC2 when the Skylights were launched. And it was a very tense moment because if you were a PhD student, several years of work would have gone into your instrument on the payload, and you really did keep your fingers crossed that um, the thing all worked okay. Because without that, your PhD would not come to fruition. And they said, you know, that is a lot more evocative than actually looking at the pictures. So if anybody knows of any other sound recordings, please do let me know. SL1305, the last British scientific sponsored launch. And there we have a, a postcard issued. On the left hand side is SL01. On the right hand side, one of the later Skylarks. They ended up being three stage rockets, a booster at the bottom, a part of the instrumentation space was taken up with another booster and these could go quite high, a lot higher than the International Space Station for instance. And uh, another use for sounding rockets is you can test your instrumentation and uh, people used to say you have to test your instruments on a sounding rocket actually in space before they would accept them on something like the Space Shuttle. Moving on a little bit, another Used for skylights was testing microgravity, testing, uh, well, not testing microgravity, but testing or running experiments within microgravity. This was before the International Space Station. And ESA built a rather fine launch tower. This was north of the Arctic Circle in Sweden, and the thing had to be enclosed because of the environment. But they had to open the hatches there and let the exhaust out when it was actually launched. This particular one included five microgravity experiments. And technology has now moved on. You can stick your small scale electronics inside. This is a video camera viewing externally through a system of mirrors. And there's a silent film there showing the view looking back. It does spin around a little bit as the rocket uh, spins. The booster falls away. So you're up into space now and you're looking down there on the fields of Norway. And for microgravity payload, you don't have to point in any particular direction. You just have to hold the payload very still and uh, your experiment can function. <laughs> 
Now, it does look a bit snowy down there, and it was said that these things were only launched in winter, so they'd have a soft landing, but um, that may have been apocryphal. But they certainly had to keep their fingers crossed that the parachute system worked. And clearly it did in this case, and they got their uh, photographs back again. One of the things that they used to do quite often for all launches was issue these commemorative envelopes. And this is rather a nice one. So you look at the top right hand side of the stamp and zoom in on it. And we can see that on the postage stamp there is a picture of a Skylark rocket being launched from that very launch tower. And that I think is unique to Skylark. Um, I don't think there's any other sounding rockets who've had that privilege. So as I noted before, the very last Skylark mission was in 2005. A 440, 40, 441st to be launched. And sounding rockets can off a fairly massive payload into space, albeit for a relatively short time. And by these days, you could put up about a third of a ton into space. And there it is being hauled up inside the enclosed launch tower. The booster is, the booster is in that orange color in the background. And then the payload is being hoisted up to be put on top. And there's a the man pressing the button. And there's the very last launch. Now the instrumentation and the, the sort of payload structure they developed for Skylark is still being launched, but the actual body of the rocket um, is no longer being made in the UK and they had to um, go to an alternative source instead. And they managed to find one in Argentina and as far as I'm aware that's still being used. So where can Skylark bits and pieces be seen today? There's a full-size model at the UK National Space Centre in Leicester, and there it is next to a Blue Street rocket. There's various other places you can go and see bits and pieces, as listed there. And the Science Museum in London opened a small exhibition to celebrate the 50th launch, sorry, the 50th anniversary of the first launch into space, November 2017. And I helped out a little bit with that. I don't know if it's still running or not. I've not been to the Space Gallery for a year or two now. And more recently than that, the Aerospace Bristol Heritage Centre in Filton has been opened. And you can see that particular model, which was put together by one of my contacts, Terry Ransom. And that Skylark 12 was one of the later versions, one of the three stage versions. Many were launched from Australia, as I've described, and you can see quite a few of them in Australia, various museums and exhibits there. They can also be seen out in the bush. They became quite a hobby to collect the spent uh, motors there. These, they, these things came whistling down, and as you can see, that one landed in a relatively soft spot. The fin assembly is broken away. And unless someone goes out to collect them, these are, these are there to this very day. The instruments would have come floating down their parachutes and be taken away for analysis. But these spent motors were not of very much interest to anybody. And so there's hundreds of these things out in the bush. And finally, as Tracy touched upon, this book, for those who want to know more information, this is the readable reference book, hardback, lots of pages shortlisted for award in 2015. Uh, £29.50 from Amazon and all good bookshops, as they say. Or you can visit my website at skylark.space and have a look inside and uh, find out a little bit more. Right, well, thank you very much, everybody, for your attention. My talk, my presentation finishes there. I'll now stop my screen sharing. I hand back to the chair. <laughs>